Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. There's no way to say this without sounding like I'm... If, especially if you don't know me, this is egotistical. I'm not being egotistical. I'm just telling you the truth. People often ask me, who do you listen to? Are there any particular preachers you listen to? Are there any particular authors, whatever, that you love? Particularly pastors or preachers. My response is none. I, I don't like any of them. Every once in a while, there's one who makes a good point here and there. But I find myself so frustrated by people who are the typical, particularly the popular ones. Not that they're all bad. They're all satanic. They're all evil. They're all... Because the more popular they are, the more of an easy target they are. And I hate that. <laughs> it's not fair for people just to, oh, that so-and-so's a heretic. So-and-so's a... Everybody who's popular is a big, easy target. So that's not my point here. I'm just saying when I listen to people, if they're popular or not popular, I tend to find myself quite frustrated by the way they handle the text. It doesn't mean they can't make a good point from time to time. It just means I find myself frustrated with the text which means I typically don't read the literature because I find myself more frustrated than I am calm. So instead, what I do, instead of reading from pastors, though pastors are overwhelmingly influential in modern church culture, I read from scholars because I don't find myself as frustrated because they nuance better, they're more informed, they have better research. And that's why my podcast, I recommend scholars all the time. I never, ever recommend pastors. Even if some pastors have some good points, my response is why go to a person who makes some good points here and there Why not go to people who make great points all the time? And I recommend Old Testament scholars, New Testament scholars, ethicists, philosophers, and so forth. Uh, There's, but nevertheless, nevertheless, there are pastors out there who are overwhelmingly influential. Uh, Francis Chan, who kind of retired, I don't know, uh, but anyway, he left his big church. And David Platt, who wrote the book Radical and does some stuff. John Piper is a Baptist Calvinist pastor. And there's several people out there who who have a major voice in modern Christian circles. And I appreciate the fact that, and I like the fact that Christian pastors have such an influence. I, I really do. Praise God they do. Uh, I wish that more biblical specialists were more voice, a louder, more influential voice. And it's, it's happening the more they write popular level literature, like an N.T. Wright or John Walton, the people who are writing, and Ben Witherington III and some others. But typically, scholars don't write for non-specialists, and that's one of the bummers. And most times, people go to pastorate. Most pastors are not trained as classicists or historians or even really good theologians. They're trained in other things, but they're not trained in that. And so when it comes to the bread and butter of what they do, they're usually subpar. Sometimes they're horrible, and sometimes they're just, they're okay. But I do very much respect and appreciate to have such an influence. And I think God can use anybody anytime he wants. He can speak through a donkey. He can speak through anybody. And I hope sometimes he speaks through me, even with all my flaws and errors and my theology. <laughs> I really appreciate Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, who says, I'm convinced at least 25% of what I'm saying is false or wrong. I'm just not sure which 25% it is. <laughs> well, I hope 25% of what I'm saying isn't wrong. But I guess it's a certain percentage. And I just I don't know which one it is either. Um Having said that, I get requests oftentimes of people, what did I think about that book or that sermon or that movie or something? But I, honestly, I just typically haven't read it or watched it because I'm just not in that world. And again, one more time, just because I feel compelled to say this again, it's not that you can't listen to them. More power to you. It's just that typically I can't because I get too frustrated with the way they do their text, with, with the text. One, some Some people... I don't get as frustrated. Some others, I get a lot more frustrated, depending on how we disagree theologically. And that means they'd be just as frustrated when they listen to me. They would say, no, 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 David, you got that all wrong. And, and I mean, that's just the way it works. But I'm not, for example, I'm not a Calvinist 
or reform. And that's a, if you don't know what that is, I guess don't worry about it right now. But to people who typically are reformed or have that particular theological slant, I can find myself pretty frustrated because I think they're misreading the text. And they would say that about me in my view. But okay. Anyway, there's a few Calvinist authors out there and, and pastors I just don't hardly ever listen to. I do sometimes because I just I just don't. I'd rather read people that I love. Uh, not because I agree with everything they say. I love them because they're always so much more researched. Because I listen, I read scholars who disagree. I, I, I read Bart Ehrman, listen to Bart Ehrman, and I disagree with a lot of stuff he says. But I listen to him and I read from him and other people. Anyway, one of such guys is a guy named John Piper. John Piper's a really, really well-known author and pastor in churchy world. If you're not in the churchy world much, you don't know who this guy is, and that's fine. But if you are, you know the name. He's a very, very outspoken Calvinist, and I'm sure does a lot of great work. I mean that. He's written all kinds of books, and he's a well-known speaker and pastor of a church. He's got no telling how many videos on YouTube and Vimeo and whatever. Anyway, he's a well-known guy. The other day, I got a, a question, as I do pretty often, that is, what do you think about this? And one was a video by John Piper. I don't typically respond to them too much with these kinds of videos because I, I don't know, I guess I just find some of them so frustrating. But this one I thought I'd respond to some thoughts on what John Piper says because it is John Piper. And I thought maybe even though I don't listen to him much ever, you might. And if you're listening to my podcast, perhaps you care a little bit about my opinion. If not, that's fine. Now's the time to turn it off. But here I'm going to play some clips of a video that he, he apparently did a long series on his website called Desiring God. And the one question, he, he's, he tries to answer several questions. And the one here that I'm going to talk about is a video that's called, Is Genre Important in Bible Reading? Well, here's some clips, and I'll respond to them. The word genre is often used to describe the kind of literature we're reading. And it's usually said that the Bible has many different genres has parable, it has narrative, it has proverbs, it has history, it has law, it has that famous one, apocalyptic, <laughs> which you don't need to know the meaning of. And I just want to register here that I have a pretty strong skepticism about being told that a text has a particular meaning because it belongs to a particular genre. Okay, let me say a few things. One is, given these one response to him isn't fully fair because he can't respond back to my responses. And I know that, and that's not, I don't know, not very fair, you might say. But at the same time, I'm not going to interview John Piper on this because I don't care that much. But nevertheless, here are just some quick responses as fair as I can be. One is, he said, most people define, or a lot of people define genre as literary type. That's true. Everybody does, not most people. Everybody defines. Genre is a French word that comes from a Latin word, of course, for genus, or the word, like the word generation. But it's any time, any literature, poetry, music, whatever, any time uh, there is a similar form, uh, content or tone or other rhetorical devices anytime something is similar to others of the same thing we categorize that we categorize it and in the bible we call it a genre or more technically literary genre and that's a kind or a category of literary composition so you can look at literary technique tone content sometimes length you just look at things that are similar if they're dissimilar, then they're probably not in the same form. But what we find is in literature, oftentimes literature does have the same kind of tone or content or subject matter, things like that, to form con to, to form genre. Now, this is ancient. Uh, Plato, Aristotle, I mean, ancient Greeks, this is a very, very, very old convention that human beings tend to write in similar styles and function and so forth, when they do literature, it's a very old technique. So this isn't a modern, newfangled, scholarly thing way to confuse things. It's very old. Uh, that's the first thing I'd say is. This, the second thing I'd say is when he mentions the different kinds of genres like parable and narrative and so forth, that's true. The The books of the Bible comparative compiled of multiple kinds of genres. And inside of a book, there can be multiple genres. Uh, Jesus himself utilizes various kinds of oral speech, and then the gospel writers use very liter various literary types of genre. 
And of course they do that because it is that they are following conventions. So it strikes me as bizarre when he says apocalyptic and then laughs about it and then says, you don't need to know that, what that means. My response is, John, why? Why in the world would you not want to know what the word apocalyptic means? Because that's exactly what the author of Revelation calls it. It is an apocalypse. That's It's a biblical word. It's the Greek apocalypsis. Is apocalyptic. In fact, knowing what the term means and why scholars use the term is overwhelmingly helpful in interpreting the text. So I'm not sure why anyone would want to disregard what the term means of a genre. It's like saying, well, there's a genre called poetry, but you don't even know what poetry means. There's a genre of gospel, but you don't know what gospel means. There's a genre of cookbook, but you don't even know how a cookbook means. That's That seems silly to me. Of course you want to know what these terms mean. You might not concur with the definition of the term as scholars use it. That's fine. But that doesn't mean you're ignorant of what the word means. I don't get that at all. And he ends by saying he is, I can't remember the exact word, but overwhelmingly or certainly skeptical of anybody who tells you that meaning is determined by genre. He's skeptical of that. Before I tell you my response to that, let's hear his reasons why. And there are several reasons. One is the person who tells you that this is such and such a genre and therefore the text has this meaning may be wrong. (laughs) You can't take their word for it. So that's the first reason. Be very careful that you don't just take the word for some scholar that this is apocalyptic and therefore it has this meaning. They may be wrong. I completely agree that scholars might be wrong and the categorization of the particular genre they give. I completely agree. But just because a scholar might be wrong, seems to me, to be no grounds at all for being very skeptical. The very skeptical. Why is it if a person might be wrong, means I I should be very skeptical? But of course, they might be wrong. What matters is not just because a scholar told you. What matters is the reasons the scholar gives for the categorization. That's what matters. Not just because they might be wrong, but because there's evidence to demonstrate they are in fact wrong. You might say it's reasonable to be very skeptical if the scholar is not very good. (laughs) If the scholar has been demonstrated to be wrong multiple times, then there's more reason to be very skeptical. You might be dealing with an incompetent person. But just because the scholar might be wrong doesn't seem to me reason at all to be very skeptical of genre. Well, anyway. Secondly, genre is not an airtight category. There's flexibility between genres. They overflow into each other, and you need to be just as flexible when you read the text. Well... Kind of. It depends on what you mean by it flows into the other text. Because in general, my response to that is, that's completely false. A narrative doesn't flow into law codes. Psalms do not flow into parables. That's what makes them different genres. If you mean it flows into them because they use words to convey meaning, or they speak a similar language or whatever, perhaps, but that's the broadest conceivable way of using similarities. What makes them distinct genres is that they do not flow that well. That's why there is a a cutoff. Having said that, there is flexibility sometimes within a narrative to employ different genres. For example, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 13 is apocalyptic in nature, sometimes called the mini-apocalypse. But Jesus also uses all kinds of oral genres and certain other literary types of Parable, hyperbole, proverb, wisdom saying, I mean, all all kinds of things, sure. But we categorize them because they are, in fact, distinct from other forms. So I just, I don't know what he's talking about there. I'm not sure what kind of definition, understanding of genre he means to understand that they flow so quickly into one another. And moreover, if certain genres flow pretty easily between another one, Why would that mean I have grounds to be very skeptical all the time of genre studies? I'm not sure why. Third reason. Reading has to precede the discovery of the genre, and therefore the genre can't completely control how you do the reading. 
You have to start your reading if you're going to be independent and not just take somebody's word for it. You have to do the reading to decide what kind of genre this is. And there must be some validity to the reading that you're doing on the way to discover the genre. So be careful because reading precedes identification of genre, not the other way around. Okay. <laughs> of course, John. Of course that's correct. You have to read. There's some level of reading before you determine the genre. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean it's false to try to determine the genre to figure out the way we should be interpreting the words we're reading. For example, if, I, if you gave me a couple of pages of a document, I didn't know where it came from, I didn't know anything about it, and I read it, and I started saying, started reading quarter cup of sugar, one pound of flour, 13 cups of chocolate chip, 350 degrees here and there, 14. I go, oh, I bet this is the genre of cookbook. And you go, no, no, wait, 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 wait now. You had to read it first. I go, yeah, I had to read it first. But it means what, listen, whatever interpretation I gave to, the, to this document before I determined the genre very well could have been wrong. Because before I determined as a cookbook, I could, I could have thought one quarter cup was poetry. And I would say, what does it represent for a pound of flour? What, what does that represent to you? Well, it tells me that life is white and full of chocolate chips. And it means, and I go, no, 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 that's a cookbook, dummy. You go, oh, okay, never mind. That was, that was wrong. That was stupid. It wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't a simile. It wasn't anything. It was, <laughs> it was a cookbook, which means it's literally describing how to make things. It's, it's called a recipe. <gasps> that's the genre. We're going to call this recipe. Which means every time I read this recipe book, it means how I'm supposed to interpret it. But yes, I read it first. It just means that when I determine the genre, it helps me look backwards and go, that's it. Now I see how the pieces fit together. And if it doesn't fit perfectly, then I got to keep searching to see if there's a different genre, unless this is a new genre. Or maybe in the document, it's employing multiple genres. That's fine. But yeah, we got to read it first. It just means that my interpretation, before I determine the genre is not certain to be what the author intended when he or she wrote it. And since that's the goal, uh, in fact, as John Piper says another thing, he calls it the golden rule of Bible. Try to figure out what the original inspired author meant. Well, I completely concur with that. He says it on a different video, maybe other places too. I completely concur. That is the goal. But since we know that inspired authors employed various genres to, uh, to talk, it matters what they thought the genre was. Remember, this is an ancient, ancient idea that goes way back when. And so when the ancient authors who wrote the Bible wrote things, they also knew how to write because they studied genres. So yes, we have to read first. Yes, we do that to determine the genre. Once we determine the genre, it is enlightening. We'll go, oh, we were right in our interpretation, or no, we were way off. And the fourth reason why this really matters is because what if an author intentionally mixes it up. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine this. What if an author says, I'm going to mingle poetry and narrative and history and law, and he's intentionally breaking some of the rules that we've supposedly found for reading each of those so that he won't be judged by any one of them alone. Now, how would you know that? How would you discover that? You wouldn't discover it by somebody telling you ahead of time, this belongs to such and such a genre. You would have to discover it by actually reading carefully and let the author give you the clues that he wants you to see that he's mixing it up. Right. So let's imagine a scenario where a biblical author deliberately tried to trick the audience. Well, uh, um, when you say he, you have to read carefully to see what the clues are, what clues would they be? What conceivable clues would you give to say, I'm deliberately being dishonest? What, what would it be? What would it, unless you said, I just said all this, but that's not at all what I meant. Are there any examples at all in the Bible where we have any clues anywhere whatsoever? Where they deliberately use a genre in a wrong way? I don't know of any. I don't know anything come close to it. The second thing I'd say is that means 
the biblical author would would distort a commonly held genre of the ancient world, which means the person would deliberately do something that could really screw up his intention. So if the ancient audience hears things in high metaphor and symbolic language and thinks they're hearing poetry, and what they really meant was something like a cookbook, well, that author really, really just screwed up because ancient authors don't think that way. Ancient audiences listen to conventions. And you need to read the ancient grammars to like a prognosmata. Read the way these ancient people thought about how to write things and how to present oral cases. They deliberately follow convention so that you did not confuse the meaning or intention of the speaker. So what he's saying is, I don't know of any example in the Bible. And two, I don't know of any example in the ancient world that anybody would ever do such a thing. So I think the question really is genuinely irrelevant. And the last reason I would give you for why being skeptical of genre control is this. I, I have found over the years that the people, or let's just say myself, that I have made the most discoveries when I have tried to let the text itself, in all of its details, dictate to me what is actually there, rather than bringing to the text an assumption about any particular genre. So he's made the most amount of discoveries when he ignores genres. Okay. Uh, my opinion is I don't care if you or anyone makes a lot of, quote, discoveries. Discoveries to me are irrelevant. What matters to me is what God wants us to understand, what is being affirmed in the text. If he means I've discovered more of what God is saying by ignoring genre, my response is, okay, I don't find that convincing in my own life, and nor anybody I've ever known who studies genre studies. I find the opposite to be the case. When I know the genre, I go, oh, now I understand the purpose of the literature, and it changes very much the quote-unquote God-given discoveries. But if you just mean I discover more, it's more intriguing because I ignore genre, well, okay, but I don't care. So, conclusion. Don't ignore genre. Of course, it's real. Poetry and Ten Commandments and narrative, they're not identical. But have a healthy skepticism of anyone who tells you this text means such and such because of its genre. There's more going on than that. To that I would say, you're right, there are different genres, but to be skeptical of the person who says it means this because of the genre, because there's more going on than that, my response is, what evidence do you have for that? What evidence do you have for the claim that there's more that's going on than the genre? Remember, genre is a literary type, an ancient convention that ancient people knew and utilized to convey various truths. They deliberately used it to convey various truths. So it's unwise of us, especially those of us who think the biblical text is authoritative, to ignore the genres they used. Now, if he thinks that... If someone says it has to mean this because it's the genre and no other meaning will do, I think I agree with him, and that would be a false assumption that no other conceivable meaning. That is, the Holy Spirit could tell you something else. That's fine um, and possible. But if you're making the argument that an ancient author, an ancient audience, would have thought of other things than what is being described in the genre, I do not find that compelling at all. To say it one more time, if the point you're making is you think that God's giving you brand new revelations of interpretation that ignore genre, that's fine. You can think that. You might be wrong and you might be right. If you're saying that ancient people did not utilize genre deliberately to communicate the truth they're trying to communicate, and moreover, that the audience would have been listening for a particular genre's take on something, then I think you're completely wrong. I think it's completely false to think that ancient people did not deliberately use genre in order to communicate truth. We have every reason to think that ancient people in general knew what genres and deliberately listened to them to figure out how to write and how to listen to the particular document. And there's a lot of reasons why I'm out of time now, but you can go read the, go read the scholars who make the argument. I find them very compelling. It is standard place in New Testament studies and Old Testament studies. Everyone knows in literature you look for genres. It's the very first thing you do 
to help interpretation. And anybody who says, I have an interpretation that explicitly violates that genre, everybody in scholarship that I know of, and certainly I'm one of them, would be very skeptical of your interpretation. So if John Piper came up to me and said, I found a discovery, David. I found a discovery in what everyone says is Jesus' parable, but I'm not going to be limited by that genre. I really think there really is a guy named Lazarus that Jesus know, and he's in hell, and he has like a magic telescope. God revealed whatever. He revealed this to me. It's beyond the genre of parable. My response is, okay, I don't believe you. I think you're wrong. I don't think at all that's what the author meant by that, nor the ancient audience would have heard when they heard it. I think when you think of some divine revelation of interpret it, might be true. It might be some divine insight. It's just I don't find it convincing. I'm going to stick with what an ancient person would have heard as best as we understand it. I will stick with that all the time more than your novel, quote-unquote, discovery of the text because of what I've said over and over and over. <laughs> because ancient authors deliberately used genres. That's how they learned to speak and to write Greek and Latin. When they use in grammar school, they learn how to various compositional uh, strategies, and they employed them on purpose. It's very, very old. So, I I don't understand exactly John Piper's point. I get the feeling and also the impression that he's very skeptical of another person telling him what to believe in the text. So it seems to be like a response to some kind of authoritarian way of reading the Bible. That is, don't trust, I'm very skeptical if someone tells me how to interpret it. I want to interpret it myself. So don't tell me how to interpret it. I'm very, very skeptical of anybody who tells me this is how you're supposed to interpret it. Because why? Because I have found so many discoveries just by reading the text myself and no one telling me at all. So just to summarize and to give a little analogy one more time. If John Piper came up to me and said, David, I've been reading this document that you call a cookbook. But I have made tons of discoveries just by reading the details of the text. And I've learned all kinds of stuff about life and love. I've found insights into relationships and insights into the nature of God. And insights into cooking and chemistry and all kinds of things. And just by reading the text. My response to John would be, brother, with due respect, if anything you say whatsoever is beyond this is how to bake a cake (laughs) or, or... to grill chicken or whatever, then I don't care. You've read into the text something that it wasn't there. And John might say, no, 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 God revealed it to me. He revealed to me. He used this text. The person who wrote this text deliberately wanted to change it up. And and he didn't really mean just literal face value cookbook. He wanted to trick us and, and use a different, not trick us, but maybe you would say trick us, deceive us change it up so that we have something new and radical. And just the details told me that my response would still be, okay, you believe that I don't at all. I think you're just simply mistaken. I think the genre of cookbook should always dictate our interpretations. It's like saying it gives us parameters. There are safe interpretations within these parameters. And then the parameters are, you've got to be talking about how to cook something, anything else is probably false. At least for me, it's not going to be convincing. That's how it is with genre studies in general. If you think a parable really means these other things, or a narrative really means these other things, or a gospel really means these other things, or apocalyptic literature really means these other things, outside of the genre studies, I think you're wrong. I think by default, I'm very, very skeptical of your discoveries. I'm very skeptical of them because I think that's they're false. But that's my view. I know I'm not trying to do cheap shots and whatever, but that is whatever it's worth to you. So my view is that genre study is profoundly important. And that's why, for a lot of reasons I've said, but it's why I study them so much. And it's why I think you ought to as well. Any good book on the subject, like how to read the Bible for all it's worth, any good Bible commentaries, any good Bible study, uh, study Bibles will help you understand genre. David, does that mean I have to know what the genre is before God can speak to me through the text? The answer is no. No, you don't have to know everything about anything before God can speak to you. It's, again, are you more likely to have a right interpretation if you read a cookbook because you know what a cookbook is and what the conventions are and the parameters are of a cookbook? The answer is yeah, sure. That's how it is with the biblical studies. 
the more we know, the better our interpretations will be. We'll stay in the parameters of what makes the most sense uh, in the ancient world conventions. Well, that's all for that. Thanks so much. God bless you. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom. And also look at my Twitter feed at glimpse the King or at Dr. D Pendergrass at Dr. D Pendergrass. There's tons of ways reached out. I hope you will send me your questions, send me your comments. If you'd like to support the ministries of Glimpse of the Kingdom, you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com. If you'd like for me to come and do some consulting, check out my website, davidpendergrassconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.